it turned into a vicious cycle. NGOs who somehow want to support these people fall into the very same narrative. This crisis narrative that is reinforced by international organizations, by the media, I think it is misleading and it's even self-defeating. Look at me. Maybe I'm a refugee. Maybe I'm a story on the news to turn off and forget about. Unprecedented 52 million people. The largest refugee crisis. The biggest refugee and displacement crisis. Desperately scared people. Fathers, mothers, children scared, running for their lives. Today, more than 160 countries agreed to adopt the UN's Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. The pact addresses, the UN says, growing global migration and lays out 23 objective, objectives I'm sorry, for treating migrants humanely. What we ensure through the adoption of the Global Compact is sustained political attention to the refugee issue. The 1951 Convention does not specify how you share burden and responsibilities, and that's what the Global Compact does. When we think about the Global Compact for Refugees, it's a unique opportunity for international cooperation. It sets up goals for each country, but there is a tendency to focus more on hosting countries, not on developed nations. I think this is a major problem with UN Convention. It is kind of empowering, again, the developed nations who usually refuse to take responsibility to host sufficient numbers of refugees. The reality is that 86%, the vast majority of refugees refugees are living in the developing world, in countries struggling with their own insecurity, helping their own populations in poverty. Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey, these three countries, when you put together their economic means, then they are actually developing countries, especially Jordan and Lebanon. But with the 6.5 million refugees, they take the burden of the refugee issue, whereas Europe or America wouldn't take the burden of the refugee issue. The Turkish government has allowed Syrian refugees to stay, trying to desperately provide for their needs. In the beginning, Turkey decided to use what we call an open door policy, but their estimation was around 100,000. But right now, the Turkey got more than 4 million refugees. Like many people would see in the TVs, there had been first an emergency response, like by providing these people with shelters, food and hygiene materials, and etc. Clothes, blankets, shelter, food are all important in the emergency phase, but we need to also look beyond that. The longer they stayed in Turkey, the less possible it turned out to be for the state to handle the situation through the principle of hospitality. So we are actually seeing a shift from the language of hospitality to language of status, rights, and freedoms. We need to provide opportunities to connectivity, electricity, education, the right to work. Rather than seeing refugees as inevitably dependent upon humanitarian assistance, we need to provide them with opportunities for human flourishing. Since it had been five years, the emergency state passed, so refugee people have other demands. They want sustainable employment. We should think of refugee camps and communities as centers where refugees can train for the day that they can go home, as agents of positive change. And still very few projects concentrate on provide a sustainable life to refugee people. People in Turkey. We should move one step beyond. We are not at that emergency stage anymore. So we should be getting more into concepts like cohesion, adaptation, integration. But unfortunately, in the field, we are way behind these concepts. I think NGOs has done a great job by filling the vacuum that is left by the government. NGOs in Turkey have proven themselves invaluable as they have shared much of the burden in a crisis that is still ongoing. They've taken action in many areas, including the delivery of basic needs such as food, but also in education, health and business as well. I believe it turned into a vicious cycle. They are on purpose keeping the refugees dependent to them, trying to make projects continue for many, many years without even evolving them, which is not reasonable because the needs and demands are changing even on a like six months basis. The Syrian conflict has torn apart innocent people's lives. This terrified little girl had nowhere to turn. Innocent, vulnerable people continue to have their lives destroyed as they lose everything they know, 
UNHCR is doing all it can to protect them. When you describe something as extremely urgent and requiring this immediate attention, this is when you can get people to respond, when you can get people to feel emotions about this. Call 1-300-826-952 and give just $13 a month. We must give them a safer life today. So you actually see that NGOs who somehow want to protect these people and want to support these people fall into the very same narrative that in the end only harms refugees. We are facing the biggest refugee and displacement crisis of our time. One of the largest refugee crises in UNHCR's history. This crisis narrative that is reinforced by international organizations, by the media, I think it is misleading and it's even self-defeating. We see this word crisis a lot being used by the civil society and especially especially larger international NGOs, who somehow have a stake in this. It is the biggest emergency that we're facing today. It is an emergency which is of unparalleled consequences for the region as a whole. When you use all these powerful words, like unprecedented, all-time high record numbers of refugees, it undermines the public support for refugee protection. I understand why international agencies use such a rhetoric. It is to raise awareness, it is to get the public's attention, but I I think it also has a negative impact, and I think this creates one of the most important misconceptions about the mobility of people. Desperately scared people, fathers, mothers, children, scared, running for their lives and, and for a new future. This discourse where you pity the refugees this is creating a hierarchical relation between the citizens and refugees. This is very hierarchical and very dangerous relationship. We see a focus on immediate emergency relief, providing shelter, food, healthcare, but the refugees are a very diverse group and people with different identities have different needs. They are also women, they are also LGBT people, they are people with disabilities. Women face heightened risks of violence and exploitation and heightened risks of all forms of gender-based violence. What we've seen is that systematically the protection risks for women and girls in particular are not being taken into account. So the idea of refugees as a singular, homogeneous group has also impacted the ways in which NGOs have responded to this. Change in humanitarian practice for women and girls hasn't come fast enough or gone far enough. Many women, many female refugees have been victim of gender-based violence during the conflict or during their displacement as well. But because of the focus on more general needs, they are not getting the attention they actually need to cope with these traumas. The net result is that refugee women continue to be abused and raped. More refugee girls drop out of school than boys. Refugee women have fewer opportunities to earn an income. Programs consistently fail to reach the most vulnerable and marginalized. Gender is a huge issue, but the thing which is a larger issue is uh, the sexual identity and orientation. For Syrians, it's kind of a double edge of the sword because usually when the refugees arrive in Turkey, they build communities around their ethnic or um, religious groups. But for gay Syrians, they're also outcasts within their fellow citizens. So rejected by their communities and being gay, it's actually even more difficult for them. Not only the refugee community discriminates towards you, but also the host community discriminates towards you. Especially LGBT refugees, they feel very void, like they don't belong to anywhere. Many NGOs had to cooperate because of the diversity of the needs of refugees. So the civil structures that are supporting this women, LGBT, LGBT people with disabilities, they also expanded their activities to also include refugees. Right now they understand what it means to be a woman refugee. I think there has been a lot of improvements in that sense. Non-governmental organizations are really responsible for creating bridge between local people and refugee communities. This is not a one-way integration, this is two-way interaction. 20 years ago we were saying this is what you need and this is what's best for you and shut up if you don't like it. Now we actually say, what do you need? What do you want? Are we doing it right? Do you agree? Do you not agree? Tell us how we can get better. And it's much more of a communication. It's a conversation. It's a two-way. There are a lot of Syrian NGOs. They even have uh, umbrella organizations to voice their concerns. But they are usually not in meetings, NGO meetings. You don't find too many Syrian NGOs represented in the civil society landscape, let's say. How many people in this room today are Syrian? Can I see a show of hands, please? One other person, two other people, that's great.
If an NGO is designing a project for Syrian refugees, you should definitely hire a Syrian refugee. This should be a standard regulation, in my opinion. If we have a genuine commitment to address the needs of refugees, we should try to find a way also in our internal organizations to include refugees' voices. Speak to us, please. Don't speak only about us. Don't speak only in our names. I invite and I urge all of you to have us Syrians at the forefront of the strategies. Thank <laughs> you.